Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and good afternoon. It's very nice to see you. Cecilia Malmström from Sweden, Alexander Stubb from Finland. We were joking around about 15 minutes ago that we're going to show some Nordic punctuality and start spot on time. And of course, we're very proud of our mobile communications and Wi-Fi's. So what happens? My mic gets muted and I get a technical problem, but alas, <laughs> here we are. So warmly welcome, Cecilia. Really nice to see you. Hello to the west coast of, coast of Sweden. Hello, Finland. Hello, Alex. Good to see you again. And good morning, good afternoon, everybody who's uh, listening or, or looking at us. It's a lovely day here in Sweden. And a lovely day up here in Finland as well, 27 degrees uh, and sunshine. Uh, so today, ladies and gentlemen, it's our second in the series of Florence conversations and interviews. You will have probably seen six of our previous um, webinars on various post-COVID subjects. And today we have the privilege of having Cecilia Malmström here, who is, uh, I must admit, a long-standing friend of mine. She was an MEP from 99 to 2006, uh, Minister of European Affairs 2006 to 2010, and then Justice and Home Affairs Commissioner and famously uh, Trade Commissioner uh, for 10 years. Um, and now she's both with the Transnational Task Force, but more importantly with as a visiting professor at Göteborg University, Gothenburg University. So warmly welcome and, and really nice to see you. Uh, before we kick off, we'll be online for about uh, 40 minutes. So we'll finish up um, at a quarter two. Uh, and I would like to say to all, all of you that more than welcome to send questions through the chat and, and we'll take those as we come along. Uh, and the casual conversation begins with uh, a very easy question. Cecilia, you were in the public life, uh, in the uh, MEP political and commissioner limelight for the better part of, of 25 uh, years. Uh, how has the transition been? How is life now as an academic? <laughs> Well, it's different, uh, of course. I was uh, in the university world before I entered politics, so in a way I'm back to the sign, scene of crime. Uh, it, it's different. Of course, if you have politics in your blood, you can't just get it out. Uh, but uh, And this spring has been extremely different, of course, with the lockdowns and, and uh, homeworking and Zooming and so on. But, but it's nice to get some perspective uh, from, from all these years of politics. And I must say that my friends and former colleagues in the current commission, they have a, a formidable task. So, so there has been days where I have not envied them and I'm quite happy to be uh, away from Brussels for, for, for some time. So it's a new life uh, and then let's see what happens next. Yeah, I, I think it's, I, I have very much the same feeling. I mean, you sort of come out from the mm. pressures of public life and, and go almost as an analytical spectator. And it's quite liberating in many ways as well. COVID did change things a bit. I don't know how for, did you say you've been grounded for four and a half months? How does that feel? Are you, are you getting sort of withdrawal symptoms from not flying? Well, you start hallucinated about airport lo lounges after a while. <laughs> No, but it's, it's true. true. I mean, like you've been traveling twice, th three times a week for 20 years and then suddenly you're, you're, you're stranded, which I think is, is good for your mental and physical health and to get the, the perspective. But of course, it's, you know, you have to get it out of your system a, a little bit. And, and the COVID crisis uh, in this regard, it's terrible in every other regard, certainly helped to, to give you some, some personal perspectives of what's important in life. Yeah, if you are anything like me, and I know you are, you've probably been given eight lectures in eight different countries on three different continents on the same day, and that was simply impossible. Except, of course, if you are on Star Trek, but you know that's a different story. Uh, yeah, let me begin Zoom, with you can uh, catch up with that now. That's right. That's true. Yeah. It's true. Even or, dinner uh, parties on Zoom, Teams or LinkedIn, or whatever yeah. system. Yeah. yeah. That's true. So, uh, Cecilia, I think the question that's on everyone's lips, not only uh, here in Europe, but elsewhere, uh, and, and I know you probably have to show some discretion in your answer, but, you know, we're all looking at Sweden, which has taken quite a different view on, on how to deal with uh, COVID-19, with the coronavirus. Uh, and obviously, the jury is still out. We don't know how it's all going to end up. But what, what's your take on, on the Swedish approach versus the other Nordics approach or, or the other European approaches? Well, as you said, it's a little bit hard to, to, to judge and fully evaluate. We've had a very high level of, of death 
uh, 5,200 people have died. And behind every number there, there is, of course, personal tragedy affecting family uh, and friends. And that is very, very high compared to many countries. So in that regard, of course, it, it's a failure. Every death is, is a failure. I think the, the original thought was to close down a few things and to uh, but leave the, um, sorry about that, but, but leave um, the society not too much locked down in order to, uh, um, you know, to, to make sure that, that, that the, the country would still function, that, that you would trust the, the, um, the citizens' ability to keep distance, to, to work from home when they could. Lots of things did close down. Uh, high schools, universities, events were cancelled, uh, restaurants were, were told to keep distance, uh, and most people who could worked from home uh, uh, as well. But, but there wasn't this total lockdown as in many other countries. I think the main problem was that the, uh, the, the virus got into so many um, elderly houses, elderly care centres, mm. and that's where the vast majority of people who have been infected and also uh, died have, have caught the disease. And that is, of course, also a huge failure not to be able to predict, but you can always look back and, and, and you know, draw lessons um, to predict that, that we, we closed them too, too, too late, uh, the visiting restrictions, and, and many of these houses were not, or care centers were not equipped with the proper equipment and so on. So that's where the, the great tragedy uh, is. Uh, not closing down schools as it looks today has not had a large mm -hmm. effect because younger yeah. kids do not transmit. It was probably wise to close down the universities and the high schools and, and, and so on. But the great tragedy was not was to not be able to predict um, the, the, the spread of the virus in the, in the care centers and the elderly homes. And that, that's, of course, something we will have to, to evaluate and to, to live with. Yeah, and I think, of course, I think there's sort of three determinants of, of how people see that various regions of the world, uh, mm. I would dare to say, dealt with uh, the crisis. You know, one is, is the morbid, the, the, the death toll and the infections. The second one is, you know, the bounce back of the economy. Is it an L-shape, V-shape, W, U, or a combination of the above? And the third one is in many ways the information war about you know how you deal with with the aftermath uh, of it and I, I think it'll take a long time for us to really understand the full implications as well but of course one of the things that you know sweden um, if, if if the rest of the world had not gone into a lockdown i think the swedish economy would not have been hit as hard as it has uh, in many ways so so i think the jury is going to be out on that as uh, as well. And, and this, I guess, brings me to, to one of the key issues here and, and one in which you've had tremendous expertise in, and, and, and that's trade and the economy. How do you feel, first of all, in a broad sense, uh, that, that how, how is this going to impact uh, trade in, in, in your mind as a former trade commissioner and now visiting professor? Well, it has already impacted, of course. The WTO estimates that by the end of the year, global trade might have gone down with 32%, which is enormous. And every country have their own figures. But, but of course, also internally in the internal market, exports and imports among the European countries have gone down 25, 26%. Uh, so it has impacted. Uh, and, and that's, you know, a as it's a global crisis that is not a, a surprise that the question is how we we deal with it of course because uh, it's also led to to uh, um, some of the global value chains being interrupted uh, because some thousands of containers have been standstill with with critical equipment other uh, companies might have realized that they're maybe too dependent on one what um, one partner to get that particular uh, the goods or the services or, or, or the equipment that, that they need. So they start looking for, for diversification. Uh, and then there is a, a growing protectionism in the world uh, as well. Some of the, that results from a sort of panic feeling that we must have for the next crisis uh, medical equipment in our own country or in our neighborhood, which is a natural reaction. But, but um, you know, all these about self-sufficiency and, and cutting down um, 
globalization and cutting down value change that, that is a worrying tendency that I, I see now so we'll, we'll see where that ends and then old conflicts that were in a little bit of a pause during the, the immediate corona crisis like the trade war between US and China is blooming up again as well so, so um, trade wise I think we, we should be concerned. How, how would you assess the early reactions of, of the European Union, especially its member states, as far as the four freedoms are concerned? Because, of course, if you looked at the knee-jerk reaction, it was about mm. blocking the free movement of goods, blocking the free movement of services, uh, blocking, obviously, the free movement of people, which to a certain extent is understandable. Um, there were uh, flexibilities in interpreting state aid rules, competition rules um, uh, in general. I mean. What, how do you assess that? Well, I think the first weeks of the crisis, uh, like beginning of March, was not the most beautiful time in European history. When every country acted on their own, there was no coordination, borders were closed, there was a prohibition of, of export of critical material and, and uh, medical equipment. Uh, and it was like 70 years of, of integration just disappeared in a couple of weeks. That is maybe, as you say, understandable. I mean, political leaders were, were panicking, people were dying. It was this big uncertainty uh, was there, but it was very unfortunate. And then, of course, the European Union has no legal competence on health issues. This is a national competence and people try to, to tend to forget that. Uh, so I think the first two weeks were miserable uh, from a European perspective. But then the Commission uh, really, you know, they, they tried to take charge and that they, they try to uh, organized so that, that uh, goods and, and um, services could cross the borders. They try to, to uh, build up joint stocks, help each other and, and to coordinate the different uh, decisions that, that were taken that influenced each other. And they lifted the internal export ban, which was good, but it resulted in an external export ban, which was bad. Uh, but um, and also, I mean, it was a quite new commission. Uh, they they found themselves in, in a very, very difficult uh, situation. So I think after a couple of weeks, they, they, they did try to take charge. And that, of course, will have to be evaluated as well. What went wrong? What can we do better in the future? How can we be better prepared for a new pandemic or a similar uh, crisis? And now, of course, with the recovery and the, the different exceptions that has been there on, on state aid and on competition and on budget rules, they slowly have to go back to normal. Uh, that, that's, that's my view uh, on that. And then we meet, need to make sure that if our leaders finally agree on, on, on the recovery fund and on the long term budget, that that money, wherever the final sum, is used in a way to uh, not put money in black holes, but to make sure that we come out of this stronger with investments for the future, sustainable investments, investments that strengthens our competi competitiveness, um, that, that, that invests in the digital agenda and so, so that we go come stronger uh, out of this. Uh, and that's the main task of, of the Commission and the leaders to coordinate that, of course, taking into account that the virus is still there. There might be a second big wave and there has been a lot of not only economic, but overall human um, calamities on this. I mean, what does it do to millions of people who've been locked in for 10 weeks? Uh, I mean, that's a psychological thing that we need to deal with as well. Yeah, I think I would go actually nuts. Yeah, I have no envy towards, uh, you know, Margaret Vestar and Phil Hogan and uh, a lot of people who have to start dismantling some of the knee-jerk protectionist tendencies that we saw uh, early on. I, by the way, hope that I wasn't cut off because your picture froze here for a second, but uh, hopefully I'll be back uh, very shortly. In any case, um, if you can, let's see. Now we're back again. Now you're back again. Was it you who were lost? No, I didn't do anything. It just disappeared. For me who were lost. This is the big. Maybe it's a system. We're okay. It, these things happen. In, yes, this is Eric, Ericsson and Nokia. You know, we're not really, you know, are we doing that well <laughs> on this? I'm a bit worried. Uh, I, I have some questions flowing in from the audience already uh, at this stage. But before I go into those, may I? sort of ask you a little bit about the the responses on that you felt from the eu on the side of you know the recovery fund uh, the link to the mff uh, the eib the ecb the esm the commission's response 
because some people would say that, well, just like you said, in the beginning of the crisis, it wasn't a great time in European history. But with all intents and purposes, if you compare it to the euro crisis, this was pretty fast. Euro crisis, it took four years to do the ESM. Now it took basically four weeks to get things going. How, how do you assess the, the role of the Commission and, and the rest of the European Union at, at this stage? No, I think the, all these institutions and acronyms that, that you were quoting there, they, they deserve credit and, and praise. And I w have been in different kind of these uh, webinars discussing. And, and if, if you talk to people from outside, um, our American friends and so on, they're quite impressed about the, 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 the speed that after the initial two, three weeks of confusion that the EU reacted and that mobilized uh, uh, emergency funds of, of different kinds and loans and came up quite quite fast with a, an amended proposal to the long-term budget, the MFF, and also this huge historical um, um, recovery fund that is now on, on the desk of, of, uh, of the prime ministers and will be subject to a lot of different dis difficult discussions, of course, but the, but the main element is there and that, that the commission who in January and beginning of February presented a lot of, of visionary papers on the digital economy, on, on a new industrial policy, on, on, on new trade policies, on, on artificial intelligence, on, on the, the, the Green Deal, which is very important, that they try to include all these things in the recovery, not saying that, okay, first we'll recover and then we'll deal with the sustainability issues. No, we have to recover or to come out of this with all this in mind, making sure that we invest in a smart, intelligent way and that we use the crisis to, to actually do something good afterwards. And, and the, the investment bank and, and IMF and, and others, I mean, IMF is not European, but, but still they were also helpful, have really tried to, to, to mobilize and if you look at on a global level, I mean, where has the United Nations been? Haven't even been able to formulate a resolution uh, on, on this. Where has G20 been? Where has G7 been? Uh, they formulated a few press releases, but, uh, but, but not much uh, substantial. So I, I think overall, the European Union has not uh, done that bad. Now, of course, we need to make sure that these proposals land in concrete sums so that we can start um, handing it out or, or giving it out or, or lending it out, the proportions are still there to be discussed uh, so, so that we can start really looking forward um, and, and, and to recover. Yeah, it's interesting, apart from the initial uh, sort of critique of the European Union, including, you know, uh, China bringing a plane full of masks to Italy and the rest of it, it's been quite quiet on that front because usually in these types of situations, you know, the, the public discourse is very skeptical, very negative and very critical about what the European Union does. But now there's this sort of deafening silence, which I think is a fairly good sign. And of course, mm -hmm. the critique comes from if we have three power blocks, China, uh, the US and Europe, China, we really don't know the figures at the moment, to be honest. <laughs> we, just, we just don't know what the truth is. Whereas the US is, uh, for all intents and purposes, in, in, in quite a chaotic state for political and other reasons. And in, in that sense, Europe has dealt with it quite well. Uh, let me move a little bit towards the uh, questions coming from the audience and, and, and put it in two directions. First one is, um, how do you see the future of EU-US relations, especially from a trade perspective? Uh, and the second one is, what are the implications of the EU and UK uh, future negotiations? So Brexit and, and future relationship there. So let's do the Anglo-Saxon angle first before I move on to China. All right. Well, the US uh, and Europe relations have been tense for, for quite some time, actually, which is, is uh, for someone who, who believes in the importance of a transatlantic strong relationship, very sad uh, to see. Uh, we are each other's most important trading partners. We trade for billions every, every day. Uh, we don't have a trade agreement, uh, but on the contrary, we now have steel tariffs and aluminium tariffs, and we have threats of tariffs from cars and wines and car Part. So, so the rhetoric is, is quite high um, and that is very unfortunate because we should uh, be able to sort out our, our own trade relations, make them easier and also cooperate when it comes to reforming the multilateral system, WTO uh, and having a, a strong view on, on certain issues vis-a-vis -vis China. And that, that is quite difficult. There has been a few progress that, that was uh, when I was trade commissioner, and I know that, that my, my, my friend and successor Phil Hogan is, is continuing to try to find a small but still 
you know, constructive agenda with our, our American partners. But that is quite difficult for the moment. And, and I don't think with the, with the very little time now remaining to the US elections, that time for, for uh, you know, a big deal or, or some, some progress in that regard is, is on the agenda. So um, that, that it, it looks a bit gloomy, I have to say. We, we should have um, every joint interest to do a few things to facilitate trade, get away with tariffs and, and do some regulatory cooperation and then sit together and see how can we fix the WTO? Because some of the critics that, that we are voicing are, are identical to the Americans. So let's see how can we do that and how can we make sure that we, we push China to be more responsible on the, on, on the global scene as well. But I, I don't really see that happening right now and that, that saddens me. Before we go to the UK then, can yeah. I just poke you a bit on the WTO? You don't have to say who is your favorite for uh, the new Secretary General of, of the WTO, but what kind of profile would you be looking at? Because of course, if we look at the WTO and multilateral trade agreements, in the past, you could almost say two, two and a half decades, they've been rather dormant. So is this a good time to try to wake up the organization? And if so, how do we do it? Well, And with whom? It, whether it's a good time or not, it's, it's an urgent time because WTO has been in crisis for a long time. It's been difficult to make decisions. It's been difficult to to solve all issues. Uh, and there, there is both the daily work, the lack of transparency and the the, the, um, the inability to, to really try to move forward on, on multilateral agreements. So there is an urgent need to reform WTO and this crisis makes it even more urgent. I think the the, um, the deadline to nominate uh, candidates is the 8th of July, so there still might be others. So I'll, I'll refrain from that, but there has to be someone that is a, I think there has to be someone with a political experience, uh, with someone who, who can really take a political fight, who can gain, if not the friendship, but at least the trust from both the US and, and, and China, and who can make sure that Europe and the like-minded reformists can, can you know, constructively work to put forward reforms and gain the trust also of, of, uh, of Africa. Uh, so that, that is, uh, that, that's important because we really need to sit down together and it's not a quick fix. It's not like we'll solve everybody, everything uh, immediately, but gradually take steps forward to reform this organization and make sure it works. It's not perfect, but it's the only thing we have. It's done really good things and without it, it will be totally rule of the jungle. And that's damaging for Europe, who is so trend dependent, and for, for small developing countries uh, as well. So I hope someone who, who dares to take a little bit of political fight uh, to do that while, of course, navigating in, in this. It's going to be a, a very, very difficult task for whoever takes uh, over, uh, because it's also consensus um, membership led organization that you operate by consensus, 164 countries. Uh, and that's, of course, really, really tricky. So, so institutional reforms will have to be discussed uh, as, as well. And there's a lot of resistance. And that was also long before the, the Corona crisis. But there's a lot of things we need to do. And there are potential things that can be concluded. There are discussions on a digital agreement that has been going on for a long time. Uh, they are dormant um, negotiations on, on environmental goods that could be picked up possibly uh, there are dormant negotiations on services and, and on other things. So, But we need to have both the Chinese and the U.S. around the table. And what's happening right now in the U.S., where the, the U.S. Uh, trade representative is proposing to, um, to redesign the, the, the tariffs and, and to, to even there are voices in, in Congress to withdraw from the WTO is, is extremely worrying. So it's not an envious task for whoever takes over. Yeah. Uh, how about China and the EU then? We just had a uh, tele-summit or a Zoom or a team summit, whatever you want to call it. Uh, quite tough language on both sides, uh, you know, uh, investment agreement and, and the rest of it all pending. What, what should Europe do on this here, sort of standing at a crossroads between the US and China? How should we play with China at the moment? Well, you, Europe has to be united vis-a-vis -vis China, because our problem in the past is that, that we've been divided, that there is this 16 plus one, that there are different uh, countries saying different uh, things, that when there are votes concerning China, for instance, in the United Nations, some countries 
uh, the European countries have voted with China and not with the EU. And that is, of course, a division that, that has been beneficial for China and very bad for us. China is a, a, a gigantic country with whom we have a lot of, of different relations. Uh, and we need to trade with them, we need to deal with them, we need to work with China on a variety of issues, not least the, the Paris Agenda and the, the multilateral system reform on, on WTO. But having said that, of course, uh, there is a very big difference in, in the values we have in the European Union and China. So we have to be very clear on that. So when it comes to you know, choosing between China and US, there's no doubt that value-wise we are with the US, but that doesn't mean that we adhere as Europeans to trade wars and, and boycotting and so on. You have to dialogue, you have to work with China, but, but it's, it's moving very, very slowly. The investment agreement has been going on negotiations since 2013. And as far as I heard from this summit last Monday, it, it didn't move either. So we need to find some sort of a positive agenda with them uh, as, why, as well. While also be, be, being tough, I mean, there has been um, uh, so, um, very aggressive investments in some key critical infrastructure that has to be, be addressed, not only from China, but mainly from China. Mm -hmm. uh, we're building up an infrastructure to deal with that as well. We have to make sure that that works when it needs to work, not a protectionist instrument, but an instrument that can say no sometimes uh, to show China that we are serious about this. And that, that also, um, as proposed this week, I think some changes in the in the in the rules of, of uh, state aid and, and competition, uh, in order to to make sure that that, that China doesn't have a um, a disproportionate advantage when they seek to invest in Europe. We need Chinese investment. We should welcome them, uh, but but there has to be uh, certain lines where where it is possible to say no as well. So you, European unity is the key to this. I think to, uh, to speak yeah. with one voice. Yeah. Hypothetically, if you were still the, the trade commissioner and you'd be grappling together with Margaret Vestar on, say, issues linked to digital and, and, and to key uh, future industries, a lot of talk about data being the new gold and 5G being the battle for the future and, and networks, etc. What, what would you do sort of in the axis between Ericsson, Nokia and, and Huawei, what would be sort of your advice to your European partners and fellow commissioners? Because of course, it's quite easy to blow this out of proportion and, and, and sort of get really scared about Huawei on the other side. It's also quite easy to be completely naive about this. What, where would you find yourself in that debate? It's a, it's a tricky uh, balance uh, uh, there as well. But, but what I think we need to do in Europe is to roll out the auctions on G5. We are lagging far behind there. Asia and, and the US. Uh, so we need to get that uh, in the market and we need to make sure that, that we, we set joint, far too divergent standards on digitalization in Europe. So we need to, to, to fix our own digital market as well. And then you cannot avoid cooperating with, with China. I don't think that Brussels should say that you should never use Huawei or, or others, but you should be aware of some of the, the, the risks and we should compare notes and we should discuss it. But it's not really the role of, of Brussels uh, to, to do that. But we have been lagging behind in Europe in our digital investments for, for a very long time, and we're suffering from that right now. And that's vis-a-vis -vis China, but also vis-a-vis -vis the US. Yeah, no, I, I fully agree with you um, on that. Can I then bring it a little bit closer to home and come back to the question from the audience on, yeah, on, on the London, EU? Yeah. And the, yeah, and London. I, mean, what, 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 I know you and I both are Anglophiles, and you know, we we think the UK is a great place and the rest of it. But what you know, what what should we do with the UK at the moment? What what's your sort of vision? Well, I I think the most logical thing to do is to to sort of um, you know take off your 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 pride from both sides and to say that the Corona crisis and the the uh, the, the impossible task to to meet in person, but also our joint wish to have a really comprehensive agreement sort of requires a little bit more time. Um, that, that, because if we want to avoid either a hard Brexit in, in, in the 1st of January or a very small and limited deal, we should give each other a little bit more time. Unfortunately, this has become too political. Uh, and Prime Minister Johnson have said that no, there will be no, uh, no, no prolongation of, of the, um, the negotiations. So that's where we are for the moment. I, I think from both sides, they are now intensifying the, the negotiations. Uh, they have good teams from both sides. 
But there's so much to talk about. And if we really want a comprehensive deal covering everything, uh, I mean, that is basically impossible to do for October. Uh, so the risk is, of course, that either it totally collapses, but I don't think so because we are, I mean, we're responsible people, but that we get a quite limited deal in, in general, maybe just focusing on, on, on tariffs. And if we don't have a plan for how to continue negotiations and to deepen that, it will harm our, our businesses and our relationships on both sides of the channel. Um, so so I, I would hope that we could depoliticize this a little bit and, and just say that, well, you know, things are like they are. We just gone through a terrible crisis. We need a little bit more time. Yeah, I think that would be a fairly good, how would I say, smokescreen uh, or a tactic for a slight delay as well. And it's a pity that politically our British mm -hmm. friends haven't used that because you really could. I mean, you look at the economic figures from the UK in the first quarter, we're talking about an economy that has plummeted roughly 25% and it ain't going to get better. I think that, you know, it's a good enough excuse to say, OK, it's not all the fault of, the, of, of, of Brexit, so let's at least try to get Brexit right. Just as a humble consumer, uh, I ordered some cycling gear from the United States, um, you know, under 200 euros. So we're talking really, you know, not uh, anything excessive. Uh, and it took me three and a half weeks to get the stuff, including, uh, you know, uh, electronic uh, customs uh, activity and others. And I, I hope we don't, we don't go into this. Mm. Um, then I have other questions coming in on, on multilateralism and the UN system, and especially the WHO, where do you see this going? I mean, earlier you said that, you know, the UN has been quite slow at reacting or hasn't been able to get anything done. Where, where do you see this going and how about the WHO? Well, WHO has done, of course, some, some very important work uh, and, and they, they should be, you know, they, we should uh, thank them for that. And it's an important, um, it has an important function, gathering almost every country in the world uh, around there with very, very um, clever analysts and, 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 and doctors and epidemiologists who have been able to, to give advice. But also their work has to be evaluated, of course. There's been different criticism, whether they are too China biased or whether they were too slow or whether they listen too much to that or that. I can't really judge that as a, as a uh, non-expert, but but I think when the crisis is over, we also have to look at the WHO and see how how did they they handle the crisis? What could they have done better? How are they prepared for for, for the next one? It's unfortunate, of course, that the US is is withdrawing from that. They have some criticism. We should li listen to some of it, but but it's always better to be part of it and reform. I mean, that's the, the European way to sit around the table and try to find a way forward instead of just walking out and slamming the door and taking a lot of funding with you. Um, because the U.S. have, have plenty of, of experts working in, in WHO, so they have a lot of influence today and also in, in, in the past. Um, so, so I hope we, we could look at that. And what to do with the United Nations? Well, that's a too big question for me, yeah. I, I think. I've, I've just been very sad to see that they've been totally quiet during this, this crisis that is truly, truly global and that maybe we haven't seen the worst of it in, in countries in, in Africa, for instance. I mean, the United World Food Programme talked about a starvation of biblical proportions that could be coming up later this summer. I don't know if that is true or not. Let's see. But, but uh, there's certainly a role for the United Nations to, to be there, but they have seemed unable to come with, with anything. Yeah, I think the only thing they came out with, and you know, I might be also perhaps misinformed on this, but in the beginning, they did call for a global ceasefire. They did. And which that was, was quite welcome for, yeah, yeah which, mm -hmm. which was important. And the impact of that, we don't really know of, 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 of yet. By the way, when you mention it's better to influence from the inside, that's the European way. I mean, one of my favorite sayings on the UK is that leaving the European Union is a little bit like leaving the internet. You can always pull the plug, but it's probably better to try to influence the content. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's a, it, it's a very rational view of looking at things as well. You know, we live in an interlinked and global world. And, and for us to be able to have any kind of an impact, you just have to sit around the tables, um, yeah. you know, where, where decisions are taken. Uh, true, I have, but on the other hand, you have yeah. to respect the, the, the vote of, of the British citizens. They voted in favour of Brexit, and that's how, how it is. And, and we can find that unfortunate, but 
but that's you know that's democracy so we have to respect that but having said that i think it's in our joint interests because our british friends are our friends they are neighbors they are yeah. allies we will have to work in a variety of areas in the future as well so we might we need for, for all of us to get a good deal yeah no i fully agree with that now our audience comes from all around the world and all the different continents and we have mentioned uh, africa we've mentioned asia we've mentioned obviously europe and, and north america but now uh, i have a question here coming in from the audience on on south america and central america Mm -hmm. The EU Mercosur agreement, with the approval of motions against the agreement in the Dutch Austrian Walloon Parliament, in addition to President Bolsonaro's policies in the Amazon, is there still hope to save this agreement? Uh, is the question. Well, I hope there is. Uh, I think they are just. I'm a little bit uncertain here. I don't know that the very latest update. I think we're just about to finalize the translations and the the legal scrubbing, so that technically it would be ready four member states and European Parliament to make a decision a little bit later this, this fall. It is an important agreement. However, I fully uh, understand the, um, the concerns related to the Amazons, which have been voiced in, uh, in, in some other countries. There are other concerns as well, but these are more of a more you know, protectionist uh, um, kind, which I don't agree with because there, there is enough protection and, and, and there are tariff rate quotas on the beef area and so on. But, but on, on the Amazons, where Brazil have committed legally to obey to their commitments in, in the Paris Agreement and to do a lot of, of the concrete issues nationally in order to comply with this. And, and I have met several times with, with ministers from the Brazil government and, and you know, reminded them of this and say, if that is not the case, there will be a risk to be a no in the European Parliament or in some, some national parliaments as well. So I, I think we need to, to see where all this ends because the, the, uh, as it is today, the, there is still a lot of things to do by the Brazil government on this. And I saw that only yesterday or two days ago, there was a, a big um, appeal from big business all around the world towards the Brazilian government to say that if you don't you know, do what you promised to do in the Amazons, we will not trade with you because we, we owe it to our customers and our buyers to make sure that, that we, we do this in a fair and transparent and due diligence uh, way. So the pressure is, is really there. I think we should finalize the procedures. Uh, and once that, that is done, uh, increase the pressure on, on the Brazil government and to see what, what they intend to do, because otherwise there is no way this would get through some national parliaments and also the European parliament. It's a pity because it's a Thank good you. deal and it will, will yeah. bring Europe and, and that part of the world even closer to, to each other. And, and you know, it, it opens up for a lot of cooperation, including on sustainability. But of course, Brazil has to obey by their commitments. I agree. Um, we're coming to the end of our time, but I'll, I'll finish off with uh, sort of um, two comments to which you can feel free to react. One is a sort of a thank you uh, as a European citizen and an avid promoter of free trade. I, I think what happened during your time as a commissioner was that Europe reacted by shifting from the attempt to push for, for endless multilateral trade agreements to bilateral trade agreements. And I don't even remember your tally, but it's extremely impressive from Japan to Korea to Mexico and now Canada and, and, and the rest of it. And I think that was exactly the right thing to do for a regulatory superpower and it gave us a competitive advantage. So that's my thank you to you and I hope you agree with that. Uh, the second one is, 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 is sort of an observation or a question. The first question that we got, and I wanted to leave it for last, um, be, because it's in our neighborhood. It's a question which says, asks that, well, will Sweden's COVID approach have a longer lasting implication on Nordic cooperation? My answer to that question is absolutely not. This is just a little blip in uh, epidemiological history uh, between our countries. But what is your take on that? Do you still love us Finns or vice versa? I love you deeply, uh, and I also love my Norwegian and, and, and Danish uh, friends. Uh, I think it's unfortunate, uh, but, but uh, of course, from their point of view, even if it's a little bit unfair, but because, for instance, in the southern part of Sweden, there are very, very few infected people, 
uh, actually less people than, than the Copenhagen region. Uh, but, but if you look at Sweden as a whole, the claim is that we still don't have the, the pandemic under control, which, which in a way is, is true. It's getting better. The, the death tolls are, are coming down, but we still have um, around between 30 and 50 people a day uh, who, who, who pass away from, from, from this. Um, so it's unfortunate that we are closing these borders that has been open long before Schengen, since the 50s. But um, I, I know, seeing it from outside, that, that our, our governments and, and have been in daily contact with each other uh, and comparing notes and, and you know, trying to, to figure out what's best and at least sharing what's happening in the different countries. So I, I hope that this will not be very long, that the borders will fully open soon again so that we, we can say that the pandemic is over or under, at least under control and that this will be a parenthesis in history because we have too much in common to let this be a a a, a conflict or, or something and i and, and i share your views alex this this will not have a long-term impact i hope but it's unfortunate of course i think these words are a wonderful way to finish our florence live interview uh today thank you very much for joining us cecilia from the uh, west coast of Sweden, beautiful Göte Borg, I remember Lisa Borg, I remember Rekan and all these wonderful places. They're all closed. Gothenburg. <laughs> oh no, will that's... not open until Christmas. <laughs> and this is this is not good. And for those who know, it's a wonderful amusement park and, and Tivoli and Rekan is a legendary uh, shrimp restaurant, which I visited at the tender age, I think, of nine and still remember it. Uh, I'll for take our you audience, thank you. I'll, I'll join you. And for our audience, thank you very much for being with us. We have the final um, Florence Live conversation on geopolitics coming up, if I recall correctly, on Monday at 5 o'clock CET, together with Michael McFaul um, and Helga Schmidt. So please uh, join us for that. In the meanwhile, I hope that all of you will have a continuous uh, lovely summer, despite the difficult circumstances that we are in. Uh, and as we would say in Swedish, hey, hey, we say snart. Bye. Thank you very much. Hey, Bye.